Our gospel reading this morning is from chapter 10 of Luke's gospel, verses 1 through 9 and 17 through 20. Please follow along on page 27 of your New Revised Standard Bible in the New Testament. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know who this man is over here, but he's really good. He's really good. Of course, that's Bruce Chamberlain, our choral director. Thank you, Bruce, for helping us. Doing such a beautiful job reading. Thank you so, so much. We're, we're so blessed with talented people in, our, in Trinity, and, and we should be thanking the Lord for them every day. The title of my message this morning is, as you might have figured out, Snakes and Scorpions, and you might know why. Now, many of us will remember that World War II was called the Good War. A descriptive title that we know has been used for various reasons. To be honest with you, I'm a bit dubious about assigning any positive moral value to war. With the exception, perhaps, of the word necessary. Yes, there are, I know, necessary wars, but it's really hard for me to use the term good war because of what war does. But this past week, just a few miles from where Amy and I live, we have witnessed what is truly a good and necessary war in the fight against the wildfire the Catalina Mountains, dubbed the Bighorn Fire. I remember week before last, when we experienced in Oro Valley, where Amy and I live, some flashes of lightning and some thunder. Didn't think anything about it. I went on to bed, and then the next morning, I looked east and saw on the mountainside some wisp of smoke. In fact, it caught my attention so much, I even woke up Amy to show her what had happened. Oh, look over there, Amy. Isn't that interesting? I thought it would just kind of go away. Since that day, Amy and I have fearfully watched the Bighorn Fire grow exponentially to well over 7,000 acres on both sides of the Catalina Mountains. Like war, a wildfire creates a foundational mission in which everyone involved must be committed. And understanding that mission is easy. It's putting out the fire. Then there are other missions 
within that foundational mission that have to be done as well. Protect property, save lives, place assets in the correct position, and deliver mass notifications for the surrounding communities. And of course, there are many others beyond that. It is a massive operation to fight a wildfire. Also, just like in a war, there are personnel, weapons, logistics, and supply lines. All of those pieces carefully meshed with each other according to a plan and a process. To my way of thinking, fighting the Bighorn Fire is truly a good war with a mission that in so many ways brings out the best intentions and talents of our humanity. Our story from the Gospel of Luke this morning is also about a mission with a foundational purpose. A purpose not only good, but for we who believe in Jesus Christ, a purpose that is holy and that is foundational to our existence. The story of the mission of the 70 disciples takes place in Luke after two crucial events. Christ's declaration to his followers that he is the Son of Man, the Messiah, and that the Son of Man will be betrayed and killed, which you can imagine shocked the disciples. And then the story, right after that, of two would-be disciples who offered to follow Christ, but gave two seemingly reasonable excuses to delay following him at that moment. One, wanting to bury his father and ask for Christ to wait. The other, wanting to return to his home and say farewell to his family. Do you remember Christ's response to their request? His response are these familiar words. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Do you hear the mission focus and intensity that Christ sets out for those who follow him? And then immediately following those words, Jesus sends 70 of his followers on a very specific mission. Just like any well-planned mission, it has an established procedure, a purpose, and a conclusion. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go. On your way, carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, Eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. Since Jesus puts this mission at the heart of discipleship, even before the church is born on that day of Pentecost, it is important for us to understand the elements of this mission. Jesus begins the mission by asking his followers to make a very specific prayer. That God will send out laborers into a, for, into a spiritual harvest that is waiting 
for the disciples. In these words, we see, first of all, that Christ's mission is connectional. It is a connectional mission. As the disciples go to different villages in pairs, believers will emerge from their work who will in turn, those believers, share the good news of the kingdom of God with others. Believers are connected to believers. All of them doing the work of sharing the kingdom. Then, after that, asking them to say the prayer, Christ supplies the 70 with what they will need for the mission. But it's not the kind of provisions that we would expect for, for such a journey. Instead of telling his followers what they need, Jesus tells them what they do not need. Carry no purse. No bag, no sandals. Now why would Jesus say this? He says it because he wants those who follow him to know that what they are doing is God's mission, not theirs. And that God will provide for them everything that they need as long as they are willing to just go. That's all he asked him to do. Just go. Jesus then, after that, instructs the 70 on how they are to act, what they are to say, and what they are to do in the places where they travel. They are to stay only at the houses to which they are invited, and to remain there until their work is finished. The disciples are not to move from house to house seeking better food or better lodgings. Rather, they, they are to accept the hospitality of those who welcome them with an understanding that this is a part of God's plan, that they are in that particular place at that particular moment because God wants them there. God has a purpose. They may not know the purpose, why God brought them to that particular house. But they don't need to know the purpose. They just need to stay where they are and do the work. Jesus tells them that their message to the household is a simple one. The kingdom of God has come near you. These words echo Christ's words from his first sermon that we read in the earliest gospel, the gospel of Mark. This is what Jesus said in his first sermon. Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying... The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. It is interesting that Christ's instruction of what the 70 disciples are to say does not include the words repent, which is always, that word is always a part of Christ preaching. Instead, Jesus tells them, the 70, to accompany their declaration of the kingdom of God with an action. Not with a call to repentance, but with an action. Cure the sick. Cure the sick. In these brief verses, we hear the heart of how Christ wants his church to exist in the world, preaching, teaching, and serving those who are in need. The exciting conclusion to Luke's story is the return of the 70 disciples 
at what we can assume would be a specific period of time, Jesus told him to be back by this period of time. So all of the disciples come together as a group after having worked in pairs, and all of them share the same joyous news. Lord, in your name, even the demons submitted to us. Did you notice Jesus didn't mention a thing when he described to them what they are to do? He never said a word about casting out demons. <clears throat> that was not a part of his instructions for the mission. But God used those disciples in real time as God needed them. And when God uses us, and we are faithful to the mission, unexpected things happen. Wonderful things. Because God is there with us, as God was with them. The 70s, the 70 disciples, amazed declaration emphasizes, shows us that they had become partners with the divine. That they had realized in doing the mission of Christ, in doing what he asked, not a job, but a call. A call. The benefits of which was a profound experience of God's spiritual presence. They had an encounter with the living God. And that is the joy that they brought back with them. The importance of the disciples' experience of God's presence, grounded in their faithful adherence to Jesus' instructions, was summarized by the great Reformed theologian Karl Barth, Many years later, in one of his greatest books, The Humanity of God, this is what Bart wrote in its early 20th century language. God wants man to be his creature. Furthermore, God wants him to be his partner. God wants light, not darkness. God wants cosmos, not chaos. God wants peace, not disorder. God wants man to administer and to receive justice rather than to inflict and to suffer injustice. God wants man to live according to the spirit rather than according to the flesh. God wants man bound and pledged to him rather than to any other authority. God wants man to live and not to die. <clears throat> Partnership with the living God. At the end of every mission, there's always a time of review and analysis. And this is exactly how Jesus concludes his mission for those he sent out. Jesus says this, See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Considering what would happen to the apostles, considering what would happen to the, to, to the disciples, considering what would happen to Christ's church in the years following Jesus' ascension, his declaration that nothing will hurt you makes no sense. Not at all. As far as we know, all of the apostles were martyred for their faith. The church was mercilessly persecuted by religious leaders, by the Roman Empire, by the pagans in the local communities where Christians worship. 
And it seems to me at least that Christians have been stung many times by the snakes and scorpions that Jesus mentions. The church has been stung from its earliest days through the dark ages into the Reformation and into our time. People still have to die for their belief in Jesus Christ. People still suffer for it. However, the summary that Jesus gives to the followers explains what he means when he talks about treading on snakes and scorpions. And it returns to the fact that our mission is God's mission. And we are instruments of God's will in all that we experience. Jesus concludes by saying, nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The end of the Christian mission on earth is the same end for everyone. We die. But through faith, we are given the grace and the gift of eternal life. And it is our task to bring and invite the world to join us. You know, in our lives, we encounter snakes and scorpions Every day. And I'm not talking about in the desert or the wilderness or in our dining rooms. Rather, we encounter snakes and scorpions in our hearts. We struggle against despair and loneliness. We fear the shadows of age and sickness and death. We question our faith. When the church fails or falls into disunity or into distress or into immorality, we see a world drowning in hate and violence and prejudice and the wildfires of humanity's inhumanity. And we ask the question, where is God? Where is God? But Jesus did not tell those who believed in him where to go and find God. He told them to just go in love and service and in the name of Christ and that God would find them. This is still our mission as believers in Jesus Christ, as disciples. It is still our mission, our call, to let God find us as we continue living out our faith as the Son of God taught us to do. Christian author and theologian Brennan Manning, who died just a few years ago, wrote these words in describing the difference between religious experience and the experience of encountering the living God. Listen to what he wrote. Sheer scholarship alone cannot reveal to us the gospel of grace. We must never allow the authority of books, institutions, or leaders to replace the authority of knowing Jesus Christ personally. And directly. When the religious views of others interpose between us and the primary experience of Jesus as the Christ, we become unconvicted and unpersuasive travel agents, handing out brochures to places we have never visited. Think about that, what Manning says. 
The church is not a congregation of travel agents for heaven. That's not who we are. It's not what we do. And that leaves us with a question. Are we, as believers, and as the church of Jesus Christ, simply going to hand out religious brochures? Or are we going to partner with our Lord and in so doing, tread on the snakes and scorpions wherever they are found to be hurting others? Because that's what we're called to do. Jesus gave us the answer to that question in one word. Go. Go without looking back. Go without excuse. Go starting now, today, that God may find us where God needs us to be doing what Christ has taught us to do. Just go. Let us pray. You call us, Lord, to partner ourselves with your Spirit and to go forth in our lives wherever we are to heal the hurts and wounds of this world, to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you. So grant us the courage to do just that, the strength and the purpose to do the mission you call us to do, so that in that day when we return to you, we will do so together with great, great joy. This we pray in your holy and precious name. Amen. Our hymn of the word this morning, and you're invited to sing along with us, is so appropriate to our message today.